Welcome to Technovation. I'm your host, Peter High. Our broadcast today comes from the most recent Meta Strategy Digital Symposium, and the topic was applying a product mindset to advance digital and technology capabilities. The panelists who spoke about the topic were Rajan Mohan, the Chief Digital Officer of Ascension, and Eben Hewitt, the Chief Information Officer of Hyatt Hotels Corporation. The gentleman who led the conversation was Meta Strategy Partner and East Coast Lead, Alex Krauss. I hope you enjoyed the conversation. We are joined today uh, by Raj Mohan. He's the uh, Chief Digital Officer of Ascension. Uh, Ascension is one of the country's leading uh, nonprofit health systems with 139,000 associates, 36,000 providers, and operating close to 140 hospitals in 19 states. Uh, in fiscal 2022, Ascension provided $2.3 billion in care of persons living in poverty and community benefits and programs. Raj, welcome. Thank you. Uh, also joined, uh, we are by Evan. Um, Evan is the global CIO of Hyatt Hotels. Uh, prior to joining Hyatt uh, about a year ago, uh, Evan was the CTO of Sabre Hospitality and Choice Hotels. He knows the uh, hospitality and travel industry very well. He's also a guest lecturer and a prolific writer. Uh, Hyatt, as you may know, is a global hospitality company, uh, operates uh, about uh, 1,200 properties uh, across 20 brands in 75 countries in the world. It has 127,000 employees and generated approximately $6 billion in revenue in 2022. Uh, welcome, Evan. Thank you. Glad to be here, Alex. Wonderful. Raj, let's start with you. Uh, you have been a, a digital and product executive at a number of organizations, and uh, now at Ascension, uh, prior to that, Qatar, uh, before that, that, at Marriott. And uh, so you have seen kind of this transition uh, from project to product in a variety of organizations. And uh, I wonder if you can speak a little bit about the uh, similarities, but also the differences uh, that you have encountered. Just to start with those industries, as you mentioned, Alex, um, I was at Marriott for several years and a small competitor to Hyatt, as well as with Qatar Airways for the last couple of years, and now in healthcare. And um, there's, a, there's obviously a lot of parallels, um, the planning process, the scheduling process, the arrival or check-in process, the delivery of care, et cetera, and paying for care and beyond. There are some key differences, obviously industry-specific differences, but a couple of them being um, in our, in healthcare, consumers and patients co-produce the service along with the provider. Whereas in the other industries, there's a service wrapper or layer that hides the delivery of the service. Pi uh, passengers don't get into the cockpits of planes uh, uh, to, to co-drive these things. So that's one big difference. And then of course, there's just this floor of pa patient safety and quality that is absolutely necessary itself. Um, the other piece also, just from a difference perspective, when we think about loyalty, we are very happy if patients heal and don't come back to us. We are not looking for frequent travelers or frequent visitors. It's quite the opposite. Um, and therefore, uh, we've organized our teams very much in the, along that journey that I just described. In fact, um, consumers have for long tolerated, I would say, less than stellar consumer experience in the healthcare space. Um, so we've organized our teams, particularly broken up the consumer journey into product teams um, uh, down that path. Um, and then staff those teams along those journeys um, itself. The other piece that's super important to us is to make it a sh make sure those experiences at a minimum are both um, have uh, reflect the equity and accessibility that healthcare deserves. Um, over 80% of healthcare decisions in households are made by women, and we want to make sure our teams reflect and do the, that kind of care itself. That's the great. journey from project to product. Um, it's not a straight, it's not a journey. It's actually two different paths. Um, I think sometimes organizations do a disservice by taking project managers and calling them product managers. They're very different and distinct and valuable functions and they need to be delivered uh, uh, and need to coexist. It's not one or the other. It's very much a, an and. Wonderful. No, I, I love the last piece, piece in particular. I'll be talking about the mindset. Yeah. And mindset is more than just roles and responsibilities and the job description and the job title. Uh, very much uh, agree with that. So glad uh, that you emphasized that. Evan, uh, you clearly know some of these aspects as well. Um, and uh, I, I would like to to uh, have you speak a little bit and share some insights uh, on, uh, you know, what it means in the hospitality industry uh, as well. Uh, I mean, you obviously, you work with a really large team across so many different geographies and, uh, uh, you know, you lead the technology function. And I just wonder if you can explain a little bit, like what it means, uh, you know, the role that technology uh, plays in this care and taking care of your customers 
Uh, and uh, I know Hyatt has a very strong uh, vision, uh, and I wonder if you can kind of tie those together and tell us a little bit about your, your leadership role in that. Yes, you bet. Thank you, Alex. Uh, you're right. It is something that's a big focus at Hyatt, and it's a, one of the reasons that I was uh, so honored to join. It's a company that is, you know, has as its vision a world of understanding and care. And the way that we think about um, the role of technology in, in shaping that human aspect um, uh, that the guests face is, is this idea of, of care, uh, that, that, you know, it's not just um, sleeping in a hotel room for a night, but the idea is, is that we want to care for you so that you can be your best. And that touches all aspects, uh, you know, of, 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 your, of your journey. And there's a lot of technology touch points in there. So the idea is that we want to be outcome focused. We want to be focused uh, in everything we do uh, on what is the change in human behavior. A lot of times IT departments focus on their outputs, right? I made a spreadsheet or I made a website, uh, but we might have some metrics, uh, but they tend to be technology focused metrics, you know, mean time between failure, you know, that kind of thing, mean time to recovery. And those are good and important metrics, but you lose something if you're not thinking about what is the change in human behavior that I'm focused on precipitating with this product or this website or this work. Um, and so uh, it's not just something that is, you know, chiseled on the marble floor of the lobby. It's something that we talk about every single day, every, every meeting. We're like, what are the outcomes? And so that means you can apply things like design thinking. You can apply things like user journey maps and, and thinking about how you create that sense of care for the customer. And we have hotel rooms that are, you know, if you stay at a Hyatt place for a business trip, uh, they tend to be, you know, downtown, you might pay 300 bucks. We have, you know, Miraval in Tucson is $3,000 a night. We have a hotel room in Cannes where, you know, movie stars pay $30,000 a night for, for one stay in a, one night in a hotel room. And when that's the case, um, that can be tricky because what it means is we have to make sure that people feel cared for in a way that scales across all those price points. You know, one of the stories I like to tell about a, a Hyatt uh, in, in, I think it's Tokyo, Michael Jackson's people called when he was still alive and said, look, Michael Jackson's coming to stay at the Park Hyatt. Everyone loves his thriller video and he loves to wear that jacket. And so we want you to paint his suite red to match the color of his thriller jacket. And of course we said, we would be delighted to do that. Now <laughs> we painted the room red, he stayed there and it, it was great. And, and then he moved on. But when you when you have to do that kind of thing to, to, to care for your guests, how does technology play there? What it means to me is that we have a sense of um, disappearing. The technology is not in your way. That's kind of one of the things I work with. So for example, uh, we can't care for you if you if we play fast and loose with your credit cards and lo lose, lose yeah. your day, right? So how do we make sure that security is focused on that sense of care and not just being tech security nerds and our CISO talks about that all the time. Raj, yeah. Raj can, I, can, I, can I just, uh, uh, I want to bring you back uh, on the topic uh, that Evan just mentioned. It's about, you know, the role of technology being kind of behind the scenes, but also I heard you speak before a lot about like how expectations change. There was the iPhone and all of a sudden the way we, we interacted with technology mm -hmm. changed, but then there's the pandemic and all of a sudden digital capabilities uh, uh, gained a whole different uh, level of prominence. Can you speak? about those changing expectations yeah. a little bit? Yeah, certainly. Um, I think, like I mentioned before, in healthcare, and I'm struck by how much Evan uses the word care. We do as yeah. well, but in the hospitality <laughs> sense. But uh, in healthcare, I think consumers have for long kind of accepted less than great experiences outside of the moment they're in front of a provider uh, itself. Um, but with the pandemic, obviously, we were all forced to um, change behaviors um, and embrace telehealth and other other mechanisms in a way that was uh, unheard of. Um, yeah. Even even for consumers and patients, it was a little bit, it was quite a bit of a challenge. And now it's just it's just the norm. And we look at technology um, not only as an enabler and provider of access. Um, we're at, like you said, we're one of the largest uh, not for profit healthcare systems in the country, and our legacy comes from nuns traveling to far corners of this country to deliver care. 
mm -hmm. um, we've kind of retrenched as a country into health systems in major locations. And digital is kind of helping us relive our legacy by bringing care back to where individuals are. So it's a point of access, but it's also a point of bringing them restoring control and visibility uh, instead of just being a cog moved across an assembly line of services in a healthcare system right. we think about again putting the consumer in in the center and organizing our services and like evan mentioned technologies that should stay in the background healthcare is very much a people to people um, kind of experience itself and as a consequence that's how we uh, enable and deploy technology um, and very much um, outcome specific. Again, we obviously look at patient safety and quality as our you know, minimum measures that are always there. But we also have started looking at, uh, in addition to healthcare specific metrics like HCAPs, NPS as a, yep. a, as a score in real time. So either you're still at the facility um, or you've just been discharged and within two hours, we're starting to measure uh, experience itself. And that then ladders into other outcome metrics that then define our investments and things along those lines. Uh, but technology is only one of three stools, right? So physical element, the human element and technology all have to come together in a very orchestrated manner to deliver for the consumer and patient and their and, and their loved ones. I liked I liked it a lot. And, and both of you actually mentioned things like customer centricity, you know, the outcome, the value focus. So which is a great way to bring in our poll. Uh, so the question was, you know, which of the product mindset characteristics do you believe have the greatest potential or positive impact in the organization? And interestingly, it's fairly balanced, I would say, and uh, not entirely surprising. Uh, I let you both comment on that. But customer centricity uh, takes the first place, uh, closely followed here by uh, organizing around value and then, uh, you know, the end to end life cycle accountability. Uh, uh, Evan, do you, do you care to comment on, on some of that? Any surprises here or any confirmation of uh, what, what you are seeing? No, thank you, Alex. It's, uh, it's, it's not particularly surprising. I, you know, I think that, you know, customer centricity, you have to start there. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, why, why are we doing this? Why is there something rather than nothing? That's got to be the first thing. How are you, how are you, you know, participating in the value chain? Um, and then, you know, the idea that, uh, you know, those two things are very highly related. So I'm, I'm not surprised those are the two top ideas. Great. And, and Ra yeah, Raj, please. Going back to your question about the project versus product, yeah. I think that end-to-end -end accountability, the, yes. having the visibility of that end goal that we're all trying to hit versus I've done my part and mm -hmm. I've finished that spreadsheet or I've deployed said system. Where, well, did it actually move the needle on what we're trying to achieve? That right. mindset across the organization, I think is important. And sometimes the customer is a state internal stakeholder. Sometimes it is a consumer rights family member, uh, but that mental shift from going, yep, I've done my part, which is how I think about projects is important. Without that, things don't happen, but moving beyond that to go, okay, how did that affect the outcome we're seeking is also a fundamental shift, I think. Even both in product and project organizations need to, need to keep in mind. Raj, before we move uh, off that topic, I, I, I wanted to direct your attention towards the accountability piece. I'm glad you, you went there. You mentioned earlier, uh, you know, the internal organization uh, and with responsibility and accountability also comes resourcing. You need to be properly resourced. So how do you ensure in that shift and the mindset shift, but also the, the workflow shift uh, that, you know, you no longer fund a project with a defined end and uh, start and end date, but now you fund the life cycle. And that's a shift, especially when you do that in an organization that may not entirely work in such way, uh, at least yet. It's a, it's more of a financial question than anything else, right? As soon as we start talking about CapEx and OpEx, That's right. uh, which is the realities of many parts of many organizations, it forces a certain type of operating model, right? So a pro CapEx project has to have a start and a finish. And then once it's done, you have to you know start to depreciate it. Um, and in many ways, in the roles that I've been in, we have had to kind of be that layer that translates that kind of financial model. Organizations work that way to how teams are funded, um, and it is a it is an adjustment and to help not only the financial organization but also strategic capital organizations understand it's you're not done, you're never done. That's right. This is not a one time project. The th thing that we also have to give back is continuous value delivery for folks to understand, yep, investment equals this, this, this. We're moving NPS score, guest set score, 
uh, revenue increase, revenue per visit increase, and be accountable for that. Just not just for the soft measures, but also the hard measures. Yes, that makes it, and in, in many ways, make the case that fits the rest of the investment cases that the organization is looking at. Right. So, do you build a hospital? Do you build a parking garage? Do you build these things? It's on our, us as a digital and other organizations to help those teams evaluate investments in that same manner. Um, but it is a continuous standard team. Um, and more and more organizations are starting to understand that because we live it in our day-to-day, -day, right? The That's iPhone right. wasn't a single model. Every year, a new version comes in. And so they're starting to better appreciate that kind of mindset. The onus is on us to make sure we're delivering value and proving it in financial terms. Great, thank you so much for sharing those, those wonderful insights. And, and Evan, before we maybe return to some of the metrics here, but uh, you both mentioned them and I'm really glad to hear that, but I, I wanna, uh, come to a topic that that uh, I thought stood out when I listened to your recent interview with Peter on the Technovation podcast. You talked about these various cultural traits and how they impact the mindset. You talked about the listening culture, the culture of agility, uh, a culture of data and data centricity as well. And I, I, I'm just curious, since you work in so many different cultures, countries, uh, across all these different brands with all these customer demographics, how do you make sure there's a consistent understanding of culture and how do you teach culture? How do you nurture the culture uh, and make, make sure it's somewhat consistent or at least brand consistent? Oh, uh, thank you, Alex. That's a great question. So the, you know, the old sort of cliche, right, is that culture eats strategy for breakfast. <laughs> and uh, it, it does, you know, you can, you can say, here's my beautiful plan, uh, but if no one's on board, then like, it's not gonna work. And, you have to reach people's minds and reach people's hearts and in order to advance your cause, whatever that is. If you say, I want to move from a, a project mindset to a product mindset and here, or we need to improve our efficiency or accountability, whatever is the you know big project that you're trying to get done, you've got to bring people along with you and 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 in order to get the real engagement and the and the real sense of satisfaction that everybody would have at the at, on the team uh, at the end of the day of a, a job well done, um, it really comes from the top. Uh, so the CEO, uh, the board, you know, very supportive of this culture. It's been kind of our big focus for a long time, and so when you see the boss acting that way, then you act that way. You have to model it, and. I think that's an important aspect of it. Uh, it's hard to to row upstream against a, a, a culture. Um, we advance it in a few different ways. Uh, one is that we have a, a people playbook. Uh, you know, so we have this is very much again uh, from the perspective. It's not just here's 200 pages in a handbook of things you have to read top to bottom or or or, or sort of hunt around in. It's it's very much a matter of here's a use case. Here's what I'm trying to do. Um, and then here are the resources for that. So the idea of, of uh, advancing a culture, I think, also starts with, with principles. Sometimes people ignore these. But when I was uh, an architect, uh, you know, back in the day, um, the idea of a principle, you know, people sh would shrug off often and think, well, that's executive fluff, you know. Um, but the idea that, say, data is an asset, you state that as a principle, do you do anything different? That's my measure. You know, are you making a claim that someone might argue against? So if you think in the real world, like, well, I have a car and I think of my car as just what gets me to and from the grocery store and that's it. And, I, you know, I just sort of drive it around for fun on Sundays and, and that's it. If you think that car is an asset, you, you treat it really differently. And, and so you treat data differently. You have a glossary, you have a taxonomy, you have an ontology, you have you know, people that are data stewards and they're known and named and they follow procedures. And so the idea of starting with principles that has been helpful in, in, in some of those cultural shifts. That's great. And, and, and Raj, I wanna come back to one topic that Eben just uh, surfaced. And that's the connection between uh, you know, the culture often perceived to be soft, but still so important, but then the metrics that you talked about. Uh, in your experience, Raj, what's the connection point? How do you use metrics to advance or, or, or solidify culture or not? And, and what's your experience in that area? I think the, the only edit that's been made to the strategy, uh, culture eat strategy for breakfast is 
it eats uh, transformations for lunch, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, the, we look at metrics in three different dimensions. One is uh, people impact, uh, given our mission. Uh, that's something that's very top of mind. And when I say people, I mean those in our communities that we serve itself, right? Are we reaching uh, underserved populations? Um, and so recently when we measured uh, Ascension.org and where our visitors were coming from, we found about 42% of our visitors come from high vulnerability neighborhoods in communities, mm -hmm. right? That becomes an important baseline and it's a metric that ties very much back to our core mission of who we are as an organization uh, with a commitment to uh, heal and with particular attention to the poor and vulnerable, right? So that's an example of a very, very digital zip code analytical metric connecting yeah. back into our core mission. And now that we have that number, we know, ah, okay, that's a baseline. It was a bigger number exactly. than I thought it would be given kind of the normal conceptions about digital experiences. And now we know how to advance that. But in addition to that, we have the usability metrics of our digital experiences and of course our financial metrics as well. Part of it is also regularly looking at these things and sharing them and asking the question, why is it moving up or down and bringing that culture of are, are the actions we're taking moving, moving in a particular direction. Um, so going back to that original metric about the 42%, that then informed our digital experience strategy of do we go app only in a certain scenario or do we go app and web? Which devices do we need to go? Oh, look, for people, we have a significant number of unhomed that use our systems that are actually turns out have smartphones, but mostly Androids. That changes our digital experience definition and approach itself. But it's connect, if, if you connect it back to our mission, people will immediately start to understand, ah, oh, we're just not measuring for measurement's sake. It is to reinforce our core value proposition. So, but that's, that's just, just one example. I, I love this interplay that you described between strategy and measurement, knowing your customer, and then driving actionability and, and uh, iterative uh, improvements of that experience. That's fantastic. Um, Evan, I, I want to come back to you. Uh, you know, we talked about strategy. We talked about execution value delivery. So as, as uh, you know, leaders in your fields, in your organizations, but also strategic thinkers who have uh, responsibilities for execution. I'm just curious how you balance kind of the strategic vision and kind of the long-term pursuit of certain ideas, but at the same time, the day-to-day -day delivery uh, and, uh, and you know, empowering, enabling teams uh, and, and supporting their day-to-day -day work. Yeah, thank you, Alex. Uh, I'm, I'm very focused on strategy. It's uh, the topic of, of one of my books, this technology strategy patterns book, is the idea of how can an architect or a CTO participate in the corporate strategy? How can you sort of in, improve your area you know, of, of, of influence? How can you be more impactful in the organization? And, and, and so the idea of saying, I'm gonna look at this holistically in terms of people process and technology, not just the technology. I'm, I'm less and less interested in the argument over you know, Node versus React, like I don't care. Uh, it's, not, it's not sort of about that. It really is about the, the strategic value creation given the kinds of macro influences and uh, as well as corporate and departmental uh, influences and, and, and goals. And then you have to map that. It can't just keep, be a strategy that you put on the refrigerator and mom tells you what a pretty strategy picture you yeah. made. You have to be able to sort of map it to real life. And so that that's the second thing. And what we've been discussing this morning is this idea of of shifting from from projects to products. To, to me, what that means is pretty specific. Um, IT tends to think of things in terms of projects uh, frequently because there's so much, uh, as, as Raj said earlier, uh, you know, there's a lot of OPEX, uh, keep the lights on kind of things and, and just, you know, let's upgrade the Windows server. Um, and so these are one-time bespoke efforts. And that means it's difficult to have a sense of the market, have a sense of the context, to have a sense of those macro influences, have a sense of, you know, it's really just a bunch of work to do for a while. And, and you don't have an associated dedicated team uh, necessarily. And, and, and you, can, you can then precipitate adding more to the spaghetti if, if you think too much in terms of IT as a collection of projects. And, and so moving to a product mindset to me means, number one, that's it's for a customer. So your, your customer, right. as you talked about in your poll, um, you're thinking about the outcomes that people want. Um, 
you have to continue to evolve that. You have a roadmap associated with it, a budget associated that's allocated, right? That's what strategy is about, is, is creating more power than the starting position would suggest. Mm-hmm. The idea that you're allocating resources in aid of some goal. If 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 you have a project, it's very, it's very discreet and one-off. But a product with an associated budget, a roadmap of here's the value we're going to deliver for these named known customers, uh, you have a manager, a product manager that's that's nurturing that over time uh, to ensure that it's it's continues to be relevant, that it continues to you know you curate that backlog, and mm-hmm. and, and it has participates in a suite of products or portfolio that you're managing, um, as Raj talked about in terms of metrics, and you know just in a more holistic way. So I just think it's a much more transparent, thoughtful, planful, sort of smart way to to think about an, an organization. That's great. And Raj, I, I, I do want to put a similar question to you, but I want to pick up uh, again something that Evan just uh, mentioned. You, you obviously, you are a digital leader, uh, but you work very closely uh, with technology and so forth. So I, as you think about, you know, long-term strategic and, and short-term delivery, uh, sometimes actually the projects, the IT projects like infrastructure, uh, you know, uh, can be really long-term and can be really more a project approach. Uh, and the digital one can maybe be more a product approach. Uh, and, and some strategic, some execution focus. How do you bring this all in sync and how do you navigate uh, compromises and trade-offs that need to be made? First off, I'm very, very grateful for my CIO counterpart in the organization. Uh, and there are, there are, like I said at the beginning, pro- there are needs for projects. When you know clearly what you need to get done and the steps have been done for several times before, have at it. When there's a lot of uncertainty, you wanna take different methodologies and approach it that way. But in reality, the um, you know the question I often ask teams is, hey, do we do we know enough and f- can create sufficient value to su- sustain a durable team over multiple years? Yeah. Fine, then you, then we can call it a product, right? Like that's the most basic measure. Otherwise, we get into this very theoretical, esoterical kind of conversation about what's a product or not. You, you, if you if over at least a three year horizon, you can see clearly that durable team can bring value that you can sign up for. Call it a product itself. Um, and regardless of the size of the project uh, or product or program, the notion of continuous value generation and de-risking through continuous release right. makes a ton of sense. Just to de-risk the project, do risk uh, these things, but also organizationally, there's a mindset around. Oh, we're doing this project and it's going to take eight years or three years or even 12 months. You lose the attention of the organization if they don't understand the continuous value generation. It's important for the not only the team members, but the program as well to see, ah, there is this infrastructure project. We are going to do this. But in year one, here are the four things we're going to drop in, the, in each of the quarters itself. That is as much about bringing folks along because what I've seen is the reverse where somebody goes off in a corner and does a two-year project. <laughs> and the organization in many ways gets paralyzed by that because like, oh, the tra- that project's going to take care of it. So this, this starts to create this expectation gulf for uh, peak that that team can never deliver. Um, whereas this continuous iterative delivery model tends to address that and bring people along. Um, and so there's just a lot of benefits it doesn't fit every model. If you're building a physical bridge across <laughs> a river, either it's functioning or it's not functioning and it's safe to cross. So it doesn't fit in every model, but in technology space, I feel there's more of a more of a space to do more iterative and continuous value generation, primarily to bring the rest of the organization along um, and build their confidence in the, in the program as well. Thank you. So we only have about two minutes left, but but uh, Evan, I, I do wanna ask you something that, that Raj just mentioned, and that is the relationship between the CIO and the CDO in many organizations. And if I can make this a little lighthearted, but I still think it's a serious topic. It's like, if you had to give any advice to your CDO counterpart, like Raj in another organization, what's the one or, or two, uh, two pieces of advice that you would give uh, the CDO uh, as he or she uh, collaborates uh, with the uh, counterpart? <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a it's a great question. I am very lucky because I have a wonderful partner uh, in the form of Arlie Sisson, our our chief digital officer here. Uh, you know, she uh, it has a, a great background and and you know, working at real sophisticated companies. And so I I think the you know the advice I would give is to spend a lot of time together to to, to understand each other. You know, it really is. I, I wouldn't presume to give any advice, but but rather to say you know if, if there is a you know, just have lunch, like know how to talk to each other. 
um, just, you know, do a little couples therapy, get that, uh, you know, emotional <laughs> like intelligence of, you know, up uh, so that, when, you know, things are going to break, there are going to be gaps, there's going to be a lot of times where you're going to want to finger point and And instead of doing that, just, you know, if you, if you know that you have a solid foundation where you could hold hands and say, look, we could be transparent about the problems here. And uh, it's not about blaming, uh, you know, it really is just about how, how do we improve things. And that's where I feel like um, I am with with my CDO. So it, it, I, it's 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 great, uh, you know, luxury. Great. And Raj, many of the things, obviously, I, I imagine uh, apply the other way around. But anything that you would want a, a CIO to know then in that relationship? Yeah, I, I would be bold as to say that I, I think the CDO role should disappear over time. It is very normal for organizations to create kind of a standalone function in the near term to give it the attention and focus and everything else. But I think over time, it needs to merge into one, one role. Mm -hmm. um, they are very interdependent. So they have to be in sync to be successful. Yeah. Um, nothing irks a CIO like something that goes over out the door with pages firing up in their production teams or their CISO calling about what yeah. the digital team does and having that empathetic relationship. But over time, I think this, these roles should be one. Somebody might talk about a CAIO, uh, yeah. you know, chief AI officer. It's just a matter of time. I'm sure somebody's got a title like that already. But uh, but I, I wholeheartedly agree with having that relationship is more key for the success of, the pro of anything either party's doing. Uh, and respect for each other's lanes, right? Like know when you're wandering into another person's lane, seek that permission or forgiveness when you're doing it, but respect each other's lane more than anything else. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Well, that's uh, we couldn't have ended this on a, on a, on a higher note. I really appreciate uh, both of you uh, having been so transparent for coming with information and sharing such, uh, such wonderful insights. Thank you, Raj. Uh, thank you, Evan. And uh, certainly plenty of topics to continue the conversation on.